Hey everybody, it's Henry Steele and today is November 17th, 2020 and then in this video I want to give you something to think about. Now what I'm about to show you, I'm sure that there's plenty of you out there who already know this, but I'm also sure that there's plenty of you out there who either don't remember this from school maybe, or they've just never learned it at all. And it's something that um, I think would be beneficial to ponder. Okay, so let's talk about it. We're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about to you, gravity. Specifically, how gravity causes acceleration in objects. Now let's assume that we have a level surface somewhere. It doesn't matter where it is. It's just a level surface somewhere, and the force of gravity is perpendicular to that surface. Or in other words, the surface is at a 90 degree angle from gravity, right? Now, if you're standing here and you're on Earth under Earth's gravity, you drop the ball, tennis ball, golf ball, whatever it might be, baseball, football, you use your imagination there. That ball will accelerate at a certain rate until it hits something that makes it stop accelerating. In this instance, it would be the ground. Um, if we put a hill on the ground right here, and this hill can be at any angle. It can be at a 5 degree angle, 50 degree angle. It could be like the example I gave where we just dropped the ball. That's a 90 degree angle, and the angle is unimportant. It doesn't matter because the ratios them about to show you show up under all circumstances when gravity's being considered here as the accelerator of our imaginary ball. So if we put a, we'll just say tennis ball, up on a hill somewhere and let go of it and it starts to roll down, it's going to accelerate and it will continue to accelerate forever in a perfect system. But obviously the world is not a perfect system because we have things fighting against the acceleration that the gravity is causing. Things like the friction between the ball, in this particular case an imagined tennis ball, and the surface it's on will result in some of that acceleration being um, eliminated essentially. Also we have an atmosphere around us and the faster an object moves, the more friction there is in the atmosphere and ram pressure created by pushing the atmosphere faster and faster, which will eventually produce what's known as a terminal velocity, where the force of gravity can no longer make the ball, in this case, accelerate anymore. So the ball's moving as fast as it can in that particular density of atmosphere. But we're going to assume that we're in a perfect system here so we can have some very easy mathematics to deal with. So we don't have to deal with the friction, we don't have to deal with the friction of the atmosphere, the ram pressure, or anything like that. Okay, so under very minimal speeds, this, um, those things would be very negligible anyway, and you would be able to have uh, numbers that come very close to what I'm about to show you. So when you let go of this ball, and you measure it with any time unit, we're going to pretend like we're using seconds here, as in 60 seconds to a minute and 60 minutes to an hour. After a certain amount of time, in this case one second, that ball will have moved a certain amount of space, or a certain amount of distance rather. And we'll just say that it's moved to this point right here after one second. So we have one second of time right here, and the ball's moved from here to here. What's going to happen is, after the second second has elapsed, or another second has gone by, this ball is going to accelerate at a rate which will produce a distance traveled that's three times the original distance that was traveled in this very first second. So that after two seconds, it's actually four total original distances. So after two seconds, the ball would be somewhere like here. And what's happened is, we'll, let me do this, we have time up here, and then distance down here, okay? So the amount of time that's elapsed, one second and then two second, 
is being shown up here and then the distance is being shown down here. So we have the original distance right here, which is one unit. But then the second time unit, or the second instance of the time unit, which in this case is one second, we travel three times as far. So that the total distance traveled after two seconds is three plus one. So it's four times the original distance in time, or the original distance. So what this actually does for us is gives us an ability to anticipate mathematically how far the ball is going to move after a given period of time because something strange happens. You would think that the gravitational acceleration is accelerating this ball at a rate of every second it gets three times further, but it's not. It's actually accelerating at a rate which produces odd number multiples of the original distance. So here's what I mean. After the third second, so we have the third second right here, this ball is going to move an amount between this space and the next space that's equal to five times the distance of this original first second. So after three seconds, that ball is going to be like somewhere down here. And then after the next second, or the fourth second, it's going to move seven times. So we'll put a little seven down here. And we'll just say that that's at the bottom here, somewhere like that. So what's happened is you can measure how far the ball has moved after one second. And that's all the information you need, the amount of time, one second, and the distance moved, which in this case, we'll just say it's one foot. And as a result, we can say one foot or one meter for those internationally outside of the United States. But the result is with that information, we can anticipate how far the ball is going to move because every second or whatever unit of time, it could be a minute, it might be two seconds, it doesn't matter. That part's irrelevant, just as long as the units of time stay equal that it will be the next, the second second, it will move three times the original. The third second, it will move five times the original distance. The fourth second, it will move seven times the original distance. And every second, since that's the time unit we're using in this instance, that it continues to roll and accelerate, it will have moved by odd number increments the amount of space will increase so that the first second it's one, the second second it's three units of distance, the third second it's five units of distance, the fourth second it's seven units of distance, and it will just continue on like that. The fifth second would be nine units of distance. And as a result, if you measure this first one right here and you say, okay, the ball is going to roll for four seconds. So it moved a foot here. And I know it's going to move three feet between in the second second. It's going to move five feet in the third second. And it will move seven feet in the fourth second. You can just add these numbers up. So seven plus five is 12, plus three is 15, plus one is 16. So you'll be able to calculate just from this original set of information right here that after four seconds, the ball will have moved 16 feet. So I actually wrote this right here. Distance moved one, then three, then five, then seven, then nine. Total amount of time. And like I said, it can be seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks. It doesn't matter. Just as long as the unit of time stays uniform, it will just continue to move. The acceleration will be that of the odd number sequence. Okay, and there's the important thing that you need to realize so that because the original move, the um, origin impulse, if you will, as long as you can measure the distance moved and the amount of time that was moved, you'll be able to anticipate, due to the acceleration of gravity, how far that object's going to move. Now, like I said, in the real world, the more you do that, or the faster that it moves, the more the atmosphere starts to affect it, the more the friction 
that the ball has between the surface it's rolling on, things like that start to affect it in the real world. But in the theoretical world, where there's no friction, there's no atmosphere, it will just continue to accelerate at this rate until it hits something where it stops. So the very interesting thing about that is if you look at the total distance moved is one, the very first measurement right there, one unit of distance, one unit of time. After two units of uh, time right here, the distance is three plus one, which equals four. And if you look, the square root of four is two right there. After three units of time, it's moved 1 plus 3 plus 5, which equals 9. And the total distance is 9, while the total time units is 3. So it's the square root of this number right here. And it stays the same right here. It's the square root of this number, 4 units of time. All this added up equals 16. The square root of 16 is 4. Uh, five units of time, total distance move adds up to 25. The square root of 25 is in fact five. So that means the relationship between the total distance moved and the amount of time is the square root. In other words, the amount of time that passes for the total distance moved is the square root of the total distance moved. So. That's just something I wanted to put out there. Like I said, a lot of you probably are already aware of this. A lot of you may have forgotten it, and a lot of you might not actually know it. But this is something that's very um, integral into something that can be really used in the markets, the stock market, commodities markets, any markets, really. So... Just thought I would let y'all hear that, see that, understand that, and then if so inclined, you're more than welcome to start looking into applying that to the markets. But anyway, I will go ahead and end the video here, so I'll talk to you in the next one.